Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar, Safety Optimization for Sexual and Gender Diverse People Who Participate in ChemSex. So welcome to everyone here today. Um, we're gonna just go over some brief orientation slides and then jump right into the presentation today. Um, so first, welcome on behalf of NAHUD or the National Alliance of HIV Education and Workforce Development. My name is Vanessa Carson Sasso and I am the treasurer for NAHUD and also the fiscal coordinator for NAHUD's um, component of the Opioid Response Network. And we'll talk a little bit more about the Opioid Response Network or ORN in a moment. Um, so quickly, uh, NAHUD is a membership organization of the AATCs and we're here to further the mission of the AATC program to increase access to and reduce disparities in and improve quality HIV care and service delivery through workforce development, education, TA, and advocacy. Um, next slide, please. So the Opioid Resp Response Network, or ORN, um, has been around since 2018. It's funded by SAMHSA. It's a partner organization. Um, the prime recipient is the Academy, American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, and NAHUD is one of many TA providers in their network. And essentially, ORN was created to support efforts in addressing the prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorder. And they've since opened their umbrella to also address stimulants. And ORN provides free resources and technical assistance. So if you're not familiar, please click on this link and check them out. They have many excellent resources. Next slide. Thanks, Liz. Um, so today um, we are offering continuing education, CME, nursing, social work, um, or if you would just like a certificate of attendance, um, we can provide that as well. So at the end of the session today, you'll get a link to the evaluation. Of course, we do ask that you complete your evaluation regardless of whether you're looking for credit or a certificate of attendance. But we do ask if you're looking for credit to complete your evaluation within two weeks. Um, and again, that link will be provided at the end of the session and your feedback is extremely important and valuable to you as we work on more webinars in this series. So thank you so much. Um, and then next slide, um, you will receive your certificate if you are looking for that um, within two weeks of completing your evaluation. Um, and as always, you know, as far as what your state licensing board requirements are in your particular state, just just to be aware of that, we always put that disclaimer on the slides. Um, so thank you, Liz. And now, um, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you today's speaker, Yona Tengi. And Yona practices in primary care at Whitman Walker Health with a focus on providing care to underserved populations, especially se sexual and gender diverse people who use substances and people living with HIV. Yona is a graduate of the Physician Associate Program at Yale School of Medicine, where they sat on the Dean's Advisory Council for LGBTQI plus affairs. Their research and educational advocacy focus on safety optimization or harm reduction for people who participate in chemsex. Perfect for today's topic. Um, they are the founder of chemsexharmreduction.org. Check that out, an educational resource for providers and people who participate in chemsex. Yona is a board member and current vice president for the education at GLMA, health professionals advancing LGBTQ equality, the world's largest and oldest association of LGBTQ plus healthcare professionals. Yona has a passion for event planning as well as community advocacy and engagement. And previously they shared their experience with the AIDS project and the LGBT PA caucus prior to Yale. Yona sat on the executive board of Brigham and Women's Hospitals, LGBT plus a employee resource group. So tons of experience, uh, just had some time this morning to, to meet them and I'm super excited to hear their presentation. So let's kick it off. Yona, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much for that introduction. Mm -hmm. Let me just get, there we go. And everyone can see my slides, perfect. All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you again for that wonderful introduction. I'm so excited to be with you all today and to talk about my favorite topic about chemsex. Um, um, as was already said, I'm a healthcare provider over at Women Walker Health. Um, today, I will discuss very briefly some off-label uh, use of medications. These will be noted both verbally and with asterisks. 
Um, I'd offer to like, like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. Uh, I'm currently coming to you from Washington, DC, where the weather can't decide what it's going to be doing. Um, this land is was stolen from the Piscata Way and Acosta peoples. If you're interested in learning more about the land that you're currently on, I really recommend this wonderful website called uh, native-land.ca, where you can learn about the peoples uh, who were once native to this land. So today we're going to talk first about theory, uh, thinking about what are the conceptualizations of addiction, uh, defining safety optimization or harm reduction. We're gonna contextualize chemsex, dive into what it is and why people do it. And um, we're gonna do that with epidemiology and syndemic theory. We're gonna talk about screening and then we're gonna talk about treatment. What you're going to notice is we're going to weight this talk more on the theory than on treatments. And the reason why is it's more important uh, to change the way we think about substance use disorders, to change the way we think about chemsex and substance use generally, than it is to know what treatment treatments. Uh, there are because that's what's really going to change your approach. That's what's going to prevent burnout. And that's what's going to allow you to better support the goals of these people and the health of these people. So with that, set up, uh, with that said, I'd like to start off with the different theories, take you sort of like a timeline through how we used to think about addiction. And all of what's really interesting about substance use disorders is addiction is that I think versus anything else in medicine, uh, there's a lot more misconceptions. There's a lot more uh, like uh, uh, treatment and there's a lot more things happening in general that are not based on the most current evidence. And what you'll notice as we go through this timeline of theories of addictions is that all of these theories are still present today and you'll still hear them. And that's why I think it's so important to review the entire timeline to bring you where we have been thinking and where the thinking is today. So especially back in the time of when the war on drugs started in the 80s, there was this idea that uh, substance use was a choice and a moral failure. And if you've worked in an emergency department, if you're a medical provider, things we hear this language all throughout things, we still hear it in media today. And it's also very stigmatized language, uh, identifying the person with the choice, language like these junkies and they're making the wrong choice. And why do the people keep on making this choice? Then we move past that to this idea that addiction is a disease. And when I think of this concept of addiction as disease, I think of all of those Facebook memes where it's like your brain on cocaine or like your brain on caffeine. And it was this idea that a uh, substance use disorder is a brain disease that is permanent, that is chronic, and that drugs rewire the brain you're is, causing permanent damage, damage and change in the way you think. But what's interesting is that uh, functional MRI studies have actually disproven this theory. Your brain is extraordinarily plastic. Uh, it can heal over time. We can take an entire hemisphere out of a child's brain and their brain can adapt and function normally. And so what we've actually shown through modern studies is that the more time someone doesn't use a substance and the more control they have, the more their brain actually goes back fully to normal. And so this idea is not really, uh, it's not completely evidence-based and we've moved past it. So what do we think of as addiction or substance use disorder today? Well, now we know that like everything, there's a lot more nuance. Uh, genetics do play a role, brain chemistry plays a role, but a large part of where substance use disorders are based in is in these ideas of social determinants of health, which are probably things that you've heard of before. What we know now is that you can predict who will get a substance use disorder, not perfectly, but very accurately with statistics based on someone's education level, their access to healthcare, their wealth, uh, whether they are from identities associated with oppression, like queer identities, racial identities that experience depression, or even their zip code. All of these things help us determine what, who is likely to have a substance use disorder because that minority stress, those multi-factors lead into this disordered behavior. So it's not just a brain disease. And I think this is very important as we go through to uh, it really changes your approach to what you're treating and what you can do and what you cannot do. So where did some of this uh, what theology come from? So syndemic theory is this idea that multiple epidemics in our society work together to make it more likely for someone to have a substance use disorder. So the idea of multiple epidemics working syndemically. So again, going back to the 80s when, uh, when a lot of this started, or not drugs, substance use has been around forever, but when we, like a lot of these theories start, uh, first came into play, there was this study in rats that some of you may be familiar with, where they basically gave a rat a button, they pressed the button, and they got a shot of a heroin, and they found that the rats would use the drugs, whether whatever drug it was, until they died. And so they said, once someone's made a substance use choice, they've started, they've had that one hit and hooked idea, that you take one hit, and you're going to use it until you die, and that's just it. But what Dr. Carl Hart did, who is an amazing researcher I would recommend to you all, is he showed that if you give the rat an attractive alternative to using drugs, they won't choose that button all the time. He gave them either a willing sexual partner or some really good food or something like that. 
And interesting, he got the appro- interestingly enough, he got the approval to try this in, in New York City people who use crack. And what he found is that when you increase the reward, the higher the reward, the more likely people would choose that alternative option to not use the substance. And this is the basis of contingency management, which is an effective treatment for cocaine use disorder that's used today, which is offering prizes for negative urine drug screens. This is also a lot of the theory that supports things like a universal basic income and stronger social safety nets, because in other countries such as Portugal, they found that these correlate to lower rates of substance use disorders for that exact reason, because a lot of these factors play in. And you can also demonstrate that for those data heads out there with really complicated statistics, There are many multivariate analyses out there showing that uh, forms of discrimination are actually additive. And this is interesting and a key point. So if you are black and trans, you are far more likely to develop a substance use disorder versus if you were just black or just trans. And the reason why is forms of oppression are additive, that minority stress is additive. And it's not a factor related to being black or to trans, it's the experience of trans uh, oppression related to those identities. So what is safety optimization? Uh, Here's a lovely definition from the WHO. Uh, Harm reduction, which is the synonym of safety optimization, is policies, its programs, its services, and its actions related at improving the safety of people, improving communities, and just basically in general, uh, making society a safer place for people who use substances. And this includes HIV infection. So Pedagogy shows that most people take away only three key points from an hour long lecture like this. I know I'm a fast talker, I'm gonna say that up front. And so I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna take a deep breath, we're gonna do some breath work. And one of those first key points is that there is no pill for chemsex or anything else that is going to completely wipe away a substance use disorder because you cannot solve these other things with a pill. Uh, we in healthcare, we love like we love working with people. We love doing the best that we can. Supporting people and supporting these goals is not going to ever be something where you can give them a pill and it's going to go away. And I think that's where so much of the burnout of people working with people who use substances comes from, is there's never going to be a treatment that erases it because it is not a brain disorder. It is multiple things that are leading to a substance use disorder, and we can only do so much to tackle those. And that's why team-based medicine is so important and why working with our partners in case management, et cetera, is so important. And we know this also from HIV care. Same idea, it takes a village, it takes community in order to tackle these problems. So that said, I'd like to start off with a poll to sort of gauge where the audience is on what is chemsex. And we'll give this about uh, two minutes until about 12.14. So just to describe also the way to do this poll, it takes a minute for the responses to show up. You just have to go uh, with a mobile device or you can text that uh, to that website and then you can answer the question or you can text my name, Yona Tangi 975 to that number. Um, I don't know if it's toll free or not, but this is using poll everywhere. Well, for over 100 participants, I have to say there's a lot of uh, unanimity, which is great. So the answer is correct, um, is that chemsex would be defined as the use of substances to enhance or enable the sexual experience. And we'll go more into that and delve more into that next. Thank you for answering the poll. So I think the number one question that I get so often from different people, or I think that a lot of providers have, especially people who aren't from the queer community or who see this in their practice, is why do people do this? Uh, What is the allure? Because I think especially to people who come from like heterosexual communities, the uh, meth is so much uh, viewed so differently in those uh, those communities. And so what I'd like to anchor us with is this quote from a wonderful social theorist, Joao Florencio, uh, who writes a lot on chemsex and gay subcultures. And I love the way that he describes chemsex. He describes it as a life-affirming cultural practice one that ensures both symbolic survival as well as material survival, not only for the men who engage in it, but also the subcultures and subcultural histories within which they locate themselves. Now that is very like fancy social theorist talk, but basically what it's talking about is that chemsex is not just the use of a substance, 
It is about, for some people, it can be material survival. So survival, like it's interlinked with survival sex work. It can be a way for them to find uh, access to means in this world. And it may even be more alluring than a lot of the jobs that are out there. And we'll talk about that later. It can be a way of symbolic survival. It can be for people that are struggling with oppression or with mental health issues, as we'll talk about next. It could be a way of survival in that way. But what I wanna highlight now with this slide as we talk a little bit more about why I do it is that chemsex can be a place where people who are on the margins feel affirmed and feel powerful. For a lot of people out there on the margins, that is a very rare experience. And so of course it is enticing and we have to think about what else is really giving that them in their life. Um, specifically for a lot of queer people who participated, chemsex can be an escape from anxiety, from other mental health issues, from body dysmorphia, from queer ageism, uh, and from racism and fat phobia, which are much stronger uh, in and more uh, present in queer communities. Um, so all of these things uh, lead people to do this, and it's very hard. Again, you're not going to find a pill that's going to give these things to those people. Um, I also like to describe it using this terrible metaphor. Um, some of you may have, be familiar with the Twilight uh, series. It's not good. I know it's not good. And now we just saw Robert Pattinson and Batman, so he's moved on. But I like to use this quote. And if you're unfamiliar with the movie, basically they're vampires who never have to sleep. And they ask this question in the last part of the saga, like, now that we're both vampires and we don't have to sleep, how are we ever going to stop having sex? And chemsex is sort of like a real life realization of that because with the use of stimulants, you can have marathon sex, sex sessions for hours and hours and you can feel good doing it. Of course, after about 48 hours, you get into psychosis because you can't go that long without sleeping. But for a lot of people, if you do it shorter then it can be extraordinarily alluring. So now let's move on from the theory to ground ourselves a little bit in epidemiology. Where is this happening? How much is happening? So there are a lot of studies out there. Um, this is my particular favorite epide uh, epidemiological study. The reason why is it's very hard to estimate chemsex prevalence. And the reason why is that it's biased based on where you look. So if you registered or you did a study with everyone presenting to a STI clinic, of course the numbers are gonna probably be much higher than if you're looking at everyone out in the community. I like this study, even though it's a global dr uh, drug survey. So it includes the US, but also other countries, but again, includes the US. And I like it for uh, one of the main reasons I like it is that interestingly enough, the goal of this study was actually these researchers wanted to prove that chemsex was not unique to queer people. And what they found actually is that it's not so much true. Now they unfortunately used a very binary definition of sex. Chemsex is most likely prevalent, especially when we think about gay men and everyone that includes, but also trans feminine people for sure. And actually trans masculine people more and more as well. Um, but they define this uh, using a binary definition of sex and homosexual, heterosexual, or bisexual, which I don't love, but the data is still good. And what I've highlighted here in this study that you can see is that the rates of G use of ketamine, of uh, methamphetamine, of poppers, of Viagra are several times much, like much, 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 much more prevalent in their homosexual communities. And so what they found is that chemsex really is a phenomenon that is really more happening within queer communities, which is what I'm using as an umbrella term in this talk. Not a perfect term, but there's a lot of different ways we can do it. And again, one of the other things I liked about this study is they said, yes, I've had sex well in this drug within the last 12 months, which I think is important because we're talking about current use. So I talked a little bit about with that social theory that chemsex is just not just substance use, it's material survival, but it's also cultural survival. What does that mean? A lot of research out there will tell you that chemsex is a new epidemic that's exploding. That is not true. Chemsex has been here for a long time. It was here before the HIV epidemic. It'll be here long, long after. Um, people have been using poppers like way back in time, so much so that back when HIV was still called uh, the heterosexist termed GRID or gay-related immunodeficiency, there was a ton of research because uh, researchers at that time thought that poppers caused uh, what was then AIDS um, at that time. So when I'm talking about the culture of it, queer, there are things that exist for queer people, especially gay men, um, that do not exist for other people. Those are things like circuit parties, gay saunas, party cruises, cruise clubs, and specific hookup apps like Grindr and Scruff, et cetera, um, that uh, allow a culture, like a uniform culture to be, uh, to be made. Um, and that, have, that has existed for a long time. And so people, uh, when you're talking about, or if you have this concept that you wanna stop someone from doing chemsex or separate them from these friend groups or these, uh, from, these, from this sort of social events, you have to remember that you're not just trying to separate them from a substance, 
you would be trying to separate from them, them from a culture. And I think that's really relevant, again, when we're thinking about this, because I think that, again, if we're talking about preventing burnout, culture is actually important. Community is protective against a substance use disorder. So it's about working within these communities, acknowledging and validating the cultural like uh, reasons and the places that people find themselves and trying to find a way to help people get to where they need to be and support their own goals without just severance. So I often pose this question because I also frequently lecture with students. If, for, if you are a heterosexual person, and this might be hard, where would you find meth if I asked you right now? And most people don't know. If you are a queer person with grinder or scrap, you can find meth in any city with almost no effort in a lot of places all over the world. Apps like Grinder and Scrap increase access to drugs, to sexual partners, to parties with a capital T. Um, there's some interesting data out there that's showing that while they decrease low, uh, isolation, they do increase loneliness. And there's a lot of bad things about them. They can harbor racism and misogyny and toxic masculinity. But what I, I want to say and put out there, I'm not actually anti-app. And what I think is so, so important is that we need to partner with them. And so what I've highlighted here is a wonderful campaign called Prepared to Party about targeting people who participate in chemsex for getting them on PrEP. And there are some really wonderful people, probably some of you among the audience, who have PrEP navigators out there at their HIV clinics who are, have a presence on Grindr and Scruff. Connecting with these communities directly is an amazing thing, and it is an effective thing. And so I encourage you all to do that and think about that, because uh, that's where we can find our patients, we can connect with our patients, we can get with them on their level. Now, in a lovely quote from one of my colleagues, you do not have to know what a booty bump is to provide good care to people who participate in chemsex. All that I want to demonstrate with this slide is that there is a discrete encoded language that allows people who participate in chemsex to talk to one another on apps, to source drugs, and to um, like text each other, et cetera, uh, without uh, directly saying what they're doing. Um, what's most important, going back to what I said and taking another deep breath from the beginning, is the way you think about this, about that syndemic theory, and about thinking when you have that patient in front of you about all the other things behind that patient that are leading them in their life, um, other than just the substance use, that have led us both to like where you are in that room. So from that, I'm going to move on now from talking about the theory, the why, the epidemiology, to talking about chemsex screening, and then we'll get a little bit into treatment. Um, we'll take all the questions at the end, Again, I know I'm talking fast. We'll have plenty of time if you have any questions, and I'd love for this to be interactive so we can talk some more at the end. So before we actually talk about the screening itself, let's talk about creating a space where you can screen. So how do we set the stage? I think the most important thing to do first, especially uh, for all of us living here in the USA, is creating a space, uh, a, a safe space for screening. We have to, you should affirm confidentiality and recognize the threat of police and state violence. Why? Because that's what's on a lot of our patients' minds. They're worried about the legal repercussions and their fears are validated. And a lot of these people have had negative interactions with police. So I always tell them at the beginning that all this uh, information is confidential. I tell people about when we're man like mandated reporting when it comes to like if a child was in danger so that they know what the relationship is and that they feel safe. But even so, I recognize that a lot of people don't wanna open up or tell you things on the first visit. So I think it's also important to make space let people know, you don't have to tell me today, you can tell me when you're ready and respect that. Leave space so that they can change their answers without feeling like they're lying to you um, leave, make, and make that space for patients. I also want to say that a urine drug screen is a vital sign. It is not a screening tool. A supportive and like a productive relationship and a discussion over substance use for the patient is not going to happen out of a gotcha moment. What you can do, though, is use the UDS as a vital sign. And a lot of patients will actually be interested in what's in their urine. Um, you should always ask their consent and you should do it together at the beginning. Tell them that ahead of time that they're going to be doing a urine drug screen and then let them know what's in their drugs because especially over the pandemic, the drug supply has gotten a lot worse. There's fentanyl and even stimulants nowadays and a lot of people want to know about how like, uh, like what they're getting from their dealer. Again, always remember that syndemic theory in the back of your mind and be mindful when you're documenting. Everyone can see our notes now. And so it's really important to use non-stigmatizing language, which is what I'm gonna take a moment to talk about next. So I hit hard again on talking about the theory. I'd also like to take a moment and a deep breath if you take something away from today's lecture about using evidence-based and affirming languages uh, or language for people who use substances. 
Now, the most important thing, um, I'm a real stickler and I love it's important for all of us to talk about our pronouns, just like it's important to use someone's pronouns. It's also important, correct pronouns. It's important to remove the a word abuse from our language, to use the word abuse when you're talking about a substance or someone who used substances, that's extraordinarily stigmatizing. And most of the time they are not abusers. They have been abused by a system. So I encourage you all to use person-centered language. So many of you, I'm sure, are already doing this um, for everyone, but also for people living with HIV. I know that folks at Nahu were really great about saying a person living with HIV. Same thing applies to substances, person living with a substance use disorder or with a substance use disorder. And as much as we can, we can try and remove the like judgmental language from our behavior, the better care we'll be, uh, we'll be providing. And I think that's especially important nowadays when we're thinking about the fact that everyone can read our notes uh, with the open access that there is through EMR and the law that went into effect in the last year. So I, like probably many of you, work at a federally qualified health center. We do not get a lot of time with the patients, which is unfortunate. So I don't want to say or that you that there's all this information you need to collect. I like to make things easy. So when I uh, do a routine substance use screening as part of like a standard screening, I simplify it five quick questions. I'm really only uh, suggesting that we add one question to our standard screening. I ask about tobacco use. I ask about alcohol use. I say, do you use any substances like cannabis? I say, do you inject drugs? And then I say, do you use any substances in a sexual context? And I always give examples. The reason why is it's important to give examples is because then people know that you know what you're talking about and they're much more likely to tell you because uh, most of the people who have ever participated in chemsex have perhaps once upon a time been in an urgent care, been in a hospital, said, oh yeah, I use meth. And then that led them down a path of having to talk to all these people. And that's what the visit like became entirely about. And it's because in this country, when people think meth, they think what D.A.R.E. taught us. They think of a person with no teeth in a trailer. And that is not the truth of what most people who use meth in this country look like. In fact, a lot of people in this country use meth, both straight and queer. And most of those people do not look like that. And so mm -hmm. it's important to remove that image from our minds um, and then just set the stage. So if you want to go a little bit further, if someone screens po uh, positive and you want to start thinking about safety, uh, questions you're going to want to ask, identifying what substances that they're using, the root of administration, whether they're eating it, snorting it, slamming is the word for injecting um, in the context of chemsex, or booty bump is like a rectal administration. You want to know where they're getting their supplies, if they have access to proper supplies, clean syringes, if they're using syringes, etc. And the most important thing is finishing with a self-reflection question. This is our second breath. I'm going to say that formally. Consent is essential and important also when we're working with people with substance use disorders. It's a form of respect and it also gives us a better relationship with the patient. So when we ask a self-reflection question and we wanna talk about safety information, which is on the next slide, we wanna ask the person if they're happy with your level of use. And if the answer is yes, then you have to be able to respect that answer. It's not our job to argue with patients or to tell them that they shouldn't feel the way they should, they should feel. We're there to help patients with their goals and what they want help with. And so if they don't want help with it, then that is their, that's like their right. So if the patient does say, yes, they would like to uh, hear some safety information. And honestly, I think it makes your life easier when you ask, because when a patient says, yes, I'll take the safety information, then they listen a lot more actively because they asked and they consented. And what you can do is you can offer that safety information and then ask, what does this mean for you? And that allows people not just to be talked at, which uh, they don't absorb much information, but it allows them to be listen to the information actively. And then if you ask them to uh, give you like, what does it mean for you? You'll allow them to apply it to their own life. And that's how I know that the safety information is really hitting them in the way they need to do. And so when I'm thinking about safety information, what am I thinking about? I'm thinking about infections. I'm thinking about overdose. I'm thinking about sexual preventing sexual abuse. I'm thinking about all these different things um, as much to my ability that I can address in that visit or I can help that patient address. So now we're going to move on to general strategies for about the next six slides and then we'll open up for questions. We'll talk a little bit about resources as well. So uh, first and foremost, test and treat STIs. In HIV care, we're doing this all the time. We do this especially for our PrEP patients as well, bringing them every three months. For people that go to circuit parties, which are events with a lot of substances and a lot of sex or to sex parties, etc., it might be worthwhile to consider the uh, utility of something like doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, this is not a talk on doxypep, which is off-label prescribing. There is research out there. I encourage you to look into it. 
Um, but for patients that are having frequent syphilis and chlamydial infections, this might be a really good option for them, especially again, if they're going to an event where they might have sex with like 20 people in a weekend, you might wanna do this in terms of STI prevention. And remember that doxycycline is prescribed chronically for people with acne. So if you're thinking about anti, like antimicrobial resistance patterns, this is really not where we're, we need to be thinking about it. Uh, PrEP is essential. There's actually some literature out there that suggests that people who participate in chemsex might be better at using it because they understand that they have a higher HIV risk. Now, I am going to take a moment to do a brief mention of a topic that's much larger, just like I kind of already did the last two, uh, for the last two bullet points on this one slide, to talk about risk compensation research. There is a proliferation of research uh, that is happening out there that is looking at if by prescribing PrEP, people are becoming more promiscuous or using condoms less. This is a form of structural heterosexism or homophobia in medicine. No one is doing this research on uh, long-acting contraceptives or IUDs. They are doing this with PrEP and it is not, it's not a just thing and it's something to be very wary of. So I encourage you all that when you're encountering these patients with high levels of sexual partners, give them the safety information, but remove the judgment. And remember that PrEP is essential for these people. We should not be withholding interventions like PrEP uh, from these people because we think it's going to make them more promiscuous because that is a that's a moral judgment. And then along those lines, think about the utility of PrEP 211. I really want to commend the New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, they have actually started a program where they will offer PrEP 211 or PrEP on demand, which is supported by the Abergay trial, but is off-label um, to people outside of circuit parties and sex events like Black Party. They were supposed to do it in 2019 or 2020, but of course it, was got, it got canceled by the pandemic. This is honestly, I think, the future of prevention. It's offering not just condoms, not just lube, but also PrEP outside of these events, which have the potential to spread HIV. Again, partnering with these organizations instead of just pretending that they don't exist. And then as we already know in HIV uh, care, the best thing we can do for all of our patients is try to minimize those gaps in care um, and letting people know about undetectable equals transmittable if they are living with HIV but participate in chemsex as a way that they can keep their partners safe. Um, because these people, they are, these communities often are very close knit. A lot of these people all know each other and they want to help each other out. So giving them that information that it's not just for them, it's also to help their community really incentivizes things for people. So this is just a little lovely graphic from a colleague of mine, a lovely colleague, Jonathan Baker, about PrEP 211. There's a lot of great research out there, or not research, excuse me, a lot of uh, great like information out there on PrEP 211. So if you are interested in this, which again, off-label, there is information out there and we can talk more about that at the end. And again, uh, something I should use as a disclaimer is that PrEP 211 is for people, only people assigned male at birth. It is not for people assigned female at birth. So if you have transmasculine people or cis females who are participating in chemsex, it would not be for them. Um, general safety counseling to start with, again, moving into sort of like counseling and treatment. Um, a lot of something that I tell a lot of my patients is to avoid combining substances. It's extraordinarily common among people to titrate their high. And what I mean by that is people will take an upper, they feel too high, they take a downer and vice versa, they keep on doing that. And more and more what we're finding in the national data is that overdoses are related to polysubstance use. And so what I tell my patients is pick one upper and pick one downer. It is much easier to treat if you do run into an overdose, if you were just taking cocaine and just G or like just meth and just G or just ketamine, like one upper, one downer, than if you're using all five of them at once. Because when you, the more you mix and match, the harder it is to sort of identify what side effects that you're experiencing. Hydration, nutrition, and sleep hygiene are key. Um, it's still kind of unknown whether the psychosis that sometimes becomes, uh, happens with meth use is directly from the dopaminergic uh, action or if it's from the lack of sleep. If you keep someone up for 72 hours, they meet the criteria for schizophrenia. I'm not just saying that, there's actually a study out there that shows us that. So sleep is really, really important. And when we're thinking about interventions, trying to support sleep hygiene for people is gonna be really important for patients that are looking for abstinence, reestablishing um, a normal sleep-wake cycle. Uh, the other thing uh, is that we'll talk more about in a little bit is that a substance use disorder is not the use of a substance. It is specifically uh, criteria in the DSM-5 that is related to out of control use, to physical dependence and withdrawal, uh, and to uh, social dysfunction. So what we actually want to do is help prevent people, if we can prevent people from getting a substance use disorder while still using the substance. That's, what's a, that's why I don't like harm reduction. It's really about safety optimization. 
because a substance use disorder is about substance use that's causing those problems. And so one of the ways we can do that and counsel our patients is to stay open and accountable with their friends. That will help them stay in control. And then of course, always seek help when it's safe to do so and when necessary. So uh, I would be remiss if I did not bring some drag queens into Nahud. I think that we can learn a lot from the communities that we are serving. These are two wonderful drag queens that I'm actually seeing tonight, uh, Trixie Mattel and Katya Zamadolochkova. And they have a wonderful little YouTube web show that's very popular called Uh with a bunch of ends. And in, they have a particular episode about drugs. And if you want to learn more about substance use in queer communities, you will never learn anything more than from this episode. And what I love about this episode is they talk about drugs as patients, our patients think of them. And I think that's helpful. Patients don't think of stimulants, of depressants and hallucinogenics. They think of uppers, they think of downers, and they think of hallucinogenics. When we're talking about chemsex, we're really talking about amphetamines primarily, GHB, GBL, and 1,4-BD, which people just call G. Uh, and then also things like ketamine and cocaine, a little bit intermixed into there as well. But Viagra and poppers also certainly are in there. Poppers is kind of like its own category. So now for these next few slides, we're gonna take a little breath. There's a lot of information here. You don't need to memorize this today. I'm gonna to tell you that now this information is out there. It's more important, like I said earlier, to change the way we think and to do the best that we can uh, for these people. So poppers are extraordinarily common. They are uh, legal. They were amyl nitrates, which is their scientific name. They were actually prescribed by us healthcare providers long ago before we had better things like nitroglycerin. They're vasodilating, they relax the anal sphincter, so they're very important for people who bought them or have receptive anal sex, and they provide a quick high. They are very well studied, and they're actually relatively safe. They have no proven immune effect. I'm happy to walk you through all of the research that leads to that, but that's where we got to today. They don't have an immune effect. They don't have an association with anal HPV. Um, anal receptive sex has an association with anal HPV, but that's a separate thing. Uh, so what are some safety strategies for these things? There is possibly some, they're very flammable, so telling people to keep them away from flames. There's a possibility that fumes might not be great for your eyes. That's probably overworked, but there was some case reports out there. The most important thing is they are caustic, so keeping them away from skin. But this is what I tell all my patients. Poppers are used a lot. People can now get Sedenafil or Viagra or Cialis offline without a healthcare provider from companies like Hims, et cetera. Poppers and Viagra cannot be combined because there's a risk for serious hypertension. I've actually had people who were older and had cardiac problems, of course, but they did actually die from this combination. That's not common. It's used commonly. For most people who are young and healthy, it would just make them woozy. But I tell all my patients the most important thing to know is that you cannot combine poppers with Viagra. You want to do one or the other. And this is relevant because especially for our patients who are using meth uh, and for chemsex, uh, meth is a vasoconstrictor, which we'll talk about next. It makes it hard for a lot of people to get an erection. They often take Viagra and they often actually also use the poppers because they're vasodilating, but they should not use those together. For some of those patients who do have that problem though, you can recommend Cavagex or uh, Trimix or Alprostadil injections directly into the penis because those can safely be used with poppers and uh, with Viagra. Or sorry, with, sorry, not with Viagra. Can safely be used with poppers. However, a lot of patients, of course, don't love to give themselves that injection, but I have used it with some patients and they're very happy with it. And then there's a theoretical risk with G6PD for deficiency. For those HIV providers out there, we're always thinking about G6PD. That is with extreme excess use. You're never gonna really come across that clinically. The message here is that they're relatively safe, but don't combine them with Viagra. Uh, what about amphetamines? So amphetamines, I think, are what people really think about when they think about chemsex. It's important to remember that most of the substances we're talking about are also medicinal substances that we prescribed. Oral amphetamines are prescribed for ADHD and for narcolepsy. Uh, narcolepsy and uh, ADHD that is not being treated or has not been formally diagnosed can sometimes be a driver for people's use of amphetamines. A lot of times uh, if you talk to a patient, they'll say, yeah, I use like uh, uh, methamphetamines and it makes me feel normal. That would be a sign that they have an underlying attention deficit disorder. They're a potent stimulant. They vasoconstrict as I was just dis uh, discussing. Why are they relevant to sex? Because they increase libido, they increase pleasure and touch sensation, and they reduce that anxiety. They allow for people to have these long uh, sex sections. Now, in terms of safety strategies to talk about with patients, it's always gonna be safe, the safest to eat something. I tell patients to get capsules though, because otherwise it'll upset their stomach. Um, smoking is the next safe. If they're gonna smoke it, it's better that they use a bubbler or a, like a water pipe and tell them to use plain water. Uh, of course, intravenous or booty pumps are going to be the least safe. 
Why are they the least safe? Because of course you're running into the same things with any kind of injection of drug use with risk of HIV or hep C um, or bloodborne infection. With booty bumps, actually, because it is a caustic chemical, it makes it more likely it's going to cause damage to the rectum. Uh, it's going to make it more likely that they will acquire an STI or HIV. Um, depending on what they're doing, harm reduction supplies like needles, filters, et cetera, are going to be really helpful for these patients. Oral care is important. There's actually research out there that shows that meth itself does not do anything to your teeth. It's the dry mouth that causes the problem. So I tell all my patients using methamphetamines of any kind to get a lot of biotin or another dry mouth rinse. Again, talking about sleep. Now, I believe there's another lecture on chemsex and I looked at the uh, wonderful learning objectives. I'm very excited to see about it. And I believe they're gonna talk about evidence-based treatments for methamphetamine use disorder. A large part of my practice here in DC is giving uh, prescribing uh, evidence-based treatments. There are off-label, but supported by clinical research treatments out there, treatments like mirtazapine, which is uh, supported by two randomized clinical trials, treatments like bupropion and naltrexone. Uh, there are a lot of different things that you can do for these people prescribing-wise. Um, so why am I not talking about this in this lecture? Because again, it goes back to what I said at the beginning. I used to talk about the treatments more, but what I found is that people were just prescribing the treatments and they had not changed the way that they were thinking and they really didn't understand why chemsex is happening. And so again, it's easy to find these treatments, to experiment with these treatments, and I'm happy to talk about it when we get to the discussion section of this, which will be coming up in a few minutes, but it's more important, and I'm going to say that I've said it a million times, to change how we think and to really understand these people, to level with them, than to know what treatments are evidence-based. Uh, GHB is a depressant, also commonly used to titrate with meth. Uh, it still can be prescribed for narcolepsy. It used to be legal. Um, nowadays, these are all derivatives of the same thing. 1,4-BD is what most people are actually taking when they talk about G. Um, it has a uh, it kind of acts somewhat similar to alcohol, but not quite. It is working on GABA receptors, but specific ones. What is the safety information for G? The most important thing you can do for people is talk to them about recovery position. The reason why people die from G is because they asphyxiate in their own vomit. There was actually a storm chaser celebrity who died on a, uh, on a gay cruise from GHB overdose, and it's because their friends left them alone in, a house, uh, in their room after taking a lot of G. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's one really important safety information. Um, again, going further into it, not needing to know for everyone, but I think other safety information that's really helpful is keeping track of your doses. Um, if someone does need to detox, it's benzos as a standard of care as well as baclofen, and baclofen can actually also be used as a treatment for people with uh, GHB use, high levels of GHB use. And then, of course, uh, involving other, uh, avoiding other depressants. So I'm going to skip this case in lieu of discussion, but I'm going to leave us with the last two slides. We're right on time to finish at 12.45, so we can have plenty of discussion, and we can always go back to the case if we need to. So I just want to highlight this last of two slides. I talked about this earlier, but I like to give a visual. I'm a visual learner. When we're talking about a substance use disorder, we're talking loss of control, we're talking about cravings, we're talking about social dysfunction, and about physical dependence or withdrawal. This is what those GSM-5 criteria really break down to. So this is what we're thinking about, not just the use of a substance. And this is why that urine drug screen is only a vital sign. Excuse me. And then again, if we're thinking about a substance use disorder, it's about, about how many of those criteria uh, that they are meeting, what moves people up and down, it's not just medications, it's healthcare access, et cetera. So with that said, I'd love to invite our moderator back. I think we're right on time. And uh, here's, I'll put up or leave up on the slide um, some of the safety information, and I'd love to get going on some of these questions. Wonderful. Yona, thank you so much. This has just been so fantastic. And we do have um, a couple questions um, from Lisa here in the Q&A pod. And as we address them, I invite others to go ahead and chat in to, well, use the Q&A pod, please, um, to put in your questions. Um, so Lisa asks, one, um, why is PrEP 211 not appropriate for cis women or trans masculine patients? Uh, yeah, so PrEP 211 uh, comes from the Ipergate trial, which is out of Europe, and it is labeled in Europe, just not in the US. 
And the simple reason why is because it was not studied uh, in uh, cis females, unfortunately. So in the study cohort where they looked at PrEP 211, which is where you take two pills two hours before sex and one the next day, then one the next day, they only used people who were assigned male at birth. Mm -hmm. um, we also know that it takes a, specifically with the um, generic, uh, the TDF FTC, that it takes a little longer to get into vaginal tissues. Um, so it's likely that we, we just don't have the data to know if it would be effective on that dosing schedule. Um, but the reason why it works, especially for people assigned male at birth is because it absorbs well into the GI tract, which is where most of the exposure is. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. And as a follow-up, Lisa was just curious to get a little bit more detail on that fabulous drag queen resource that you gave us. So either the name of their channel or a link to their channel in the chat, whatever works for you, but um, just a little more detail on that would be appreciated. Yeah, I will throw that in the chat. Um, the name is strange and it's funny. It turned into a very prolific uh, show. I think there's over 150 episodes. When they named it, they did not realize it was gonna end up being a show where they would have millions of viewers and it would go that well. The name is hard to say. It's literally, uh. Um, but yeah, and you can just, I'll write the names of those people. Wonderful, wonderful. Cause of course we have another um, question from Carrie Lynn um, asking for the same thing. So we will be on that and in the chat momentarily. So thank you for that. And then um, next up we have Cecil. Hey Cecil, um, can you address queer ageism and chemsex particularly in the context of HIV and aging? How is this impacting sexual health geriatric care, if at all. Thank you. Absolutely, uh, I'd love to. So there's a really wonderful documentary out there called Crystal City. Um, and if we're thinking about important things in the timeline of chemsex, chemsex has existed for a long time, as I said, but it certainly rose in the time of the beginning of the HIV epidemic. And then it rose and has exploded again. Um, it never went away. It just has changed how it happened. Uh, with the advent of apps because it became so much easier and sort of where people were having sex changed. So um, do, uh, what I would say uh, in terms of like the aging thing, so a lot of people, again, this can sometimes be a form of self-medicating, especially people who lived through the times of AIDS before there were effective treatments, they self-medicated with math. There was a strong culture of this. Um, it was a way, again, that they could feel powerful, the way that they could sort of ignore the awful things that were happening around them. Um, and so there are a lot of people who survived through the epidemic of, uh, of HIV, uh, especially who are older, who participate in this practice and they are their survivors and they've just kept this practice uh, their whole time. I've had, I've had some people um, who participate in chemsex or patients of mine who are 65, 68, et cetera. And um, certainly for them, it has just been a mode of survival this entire time. And so I think that uh, specifically for our older uh, queer adults is something to be important is that they have a large amount of trauma. And so their substance use uh, specifically for them is often linked specifically to that trauma. And I apologize, the reason why I was looking around before this, there's some industrial noise around me. So if you can hear that, I do apologize. They're doing something behind my building. Um, so the other thing, sorry, hopping back in, you said about queer ageism. So in all communities, uh, things uh, like fat phobia and ageism exists, but especially in queer communities, there can be this idea that you want to be young looking, like youth can be craved uh, as well. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of sort of stigma, especially because we also lost most of our queer adults, our queer elders, there's a lot of stigma uh, or ageism against our older people. And the older people who are in our communities who are mostly missing, the ones who are left behind are often people who have experienced a lot of trauma. And so I think that's all really interrelated in this like very connected web where, and the most important things is like the experience trauma. And I think just like a misunderstanding between the generations, you know, um, and a lot of self-treatment quite frankly. Sorry, that's very meandering. I hope Hope you got something out of that. If you have any follow-up questions, please let me know. And also I'm happy to talk more about evidence-based treatments because we've been making really good time. Um, if that's something people are interested in, um, but yes. This is, this is great, Yona, thank you so much. And we do have a few more questions here in the pod. So I'm gonna keep going if that works for you. Absolutely. Um, awesome. So. Next, um, this is an anonymous attendee. Uh, why do people think the term disorder OS not stigmatized? It implies there is something wrong with you. Why not just categorize as mild, moderate, and heavy substance use? 
because the substance use is not the problem. So again, thinking about that slide, uh, or going back, the majority, actually, this is great data from Carl Hart. Thank you for bringing up this question. The majority of people who use substances, including the majority of people who use meth, do not have a substance use disorder. They're just using a substance. And it's not even categorized as mild, medium, or uh, sorry, mild, moderate, or severe. They're just using a substance. Disordered substance use is about a disordered relationship with that substance. So if we go back to that slide where it was about the DSM-5 criteria, none of those criteria was use meth or use as heroin. You can use heroin, you can use any of these substances and not have a substance use disorder. Those, uh, what makes it disordered use is having cravings for that substance, not, be able, not being able to function socially in situations like, uh, like uh, having that substance uh, affect relationships with people, isolating you, et cetera. Um, having issues where you are physically withdrawing from that substance, uh, from that substance, or that you uh, have like a physical dependence on it. That's what makes disordered substance use. So that's what I would say is like it's non-stigmatizing language uh, for the behavioral problem that can happen. That doesn't happen though all the time. Again, the majority of the people even using math do not meet criteria for a substance use disorder. And a substance use disorder, again, from that other side is a spectrum. You can, meet, you can meet criteria for substance use disorder for a period of your life. And then even without ever going into treatment, you can come out of that. And that happens all the time. I'm gonna use a terrible cultural reference if anyone saw And Just Like That, which is the reboot of Sex in the City, they had a depiction this year, which was not perfect, of a character who developed an alcohol use disorder over the pandemic. And at the end of it, she just kind of pulled herself out. Now that isn't possible for a lot of people, but the reason why I specifically wanna highlight that might've been possible for her is she was someone with all the resources in the world. The people who are most affected by substance use disorders do not have these resources. And the things that are driving your substance use, problems in their life, fearing like discrimination, violence, et cetera, are not often going away. And so that's what leads them to continue to have this uh, relationship with substances. And then also the last thing I'll say, because I'm gonna, I think this is a lovely question, thank you so much, is that the way we have designed society makes substance use disorders perpetuate. Our cycle of like prison violence uh, really leads to substance use disorders. And when we incarcerate people and then they come out it prevents them from accessing, uh, like accessing economies, from being able to have a stable job, a stable income, stable housing. And that, again, is a risk factor, that destabilization is a risk factor for su disordered substance use. And so I think it's really important to think about that interplay as well. But I do agree with you. For a regular person using a substance, it's not substance use disorder. They're just using a substance. They use meth. They use G or whatever it is. Thank you. Great. Yes, yes, excellent question, thank you. And three more currently in the Q&A here. So um, next, Mar says, especially following the Ed Buck trial, I'm hearing more and more about older white men engaging in predatory behavior with younger men of color with meth slash chemsex as the fulcrum. Any insight or tips? So I would say that um, sexual abuse is sexual abuse. Of course, uh, substances, especially depressants, can be used um, by some people, perpetrators of sexual violence, to make that happen. Um, and of course, substance use can also sometimes make us more vulnerable to experiencing sexual abuse, but especially if people are relying on that as a uh, means of economic survival. So people who are using chemsex parties as a way to live, to find housing, to find resources, are exceptionally vulnerable to this specifically. Uh, in terms of, but I would not say that chemsex is a scourge that is causing that. I think that these social problems are what are really the root of it. Um, poverty and racism, structural racism especially. Um, I don't, you can't just, uh, there are plenty of countries like substance use, actually chemsex is way more prevalent than Europe than here, but their outcomes are better. Why are their outcomes are better? Because the way their society is structured and the way they do treatment is better. Uh, I like actually had a wonderful experience when I studied abroad to really get involved with the Dean Street Clinic in London. They are like a world, like a world renowned clinic, both for how they treat HIV, how they do PrEP and how they do STIs, but also for their chemsex services. And they provide peer support, they provide harm reduction and they provide information. And that's what's most important about combating these things. I hope that answered that question. Great, thank you, thank you. So two more here in the Q&A pod. Um, uh, another anonymous um, attendee, is U equals U only relevant to sexual exposure or is it true for other exposures like bloodborne, work, sharing, et cetera? 
So um, what I tell my patients is that, so when they looked at the partner study, that's specifically looking about sexual exposure. And there's a couple of things. When we think about undetectable equals untransmittable. I have this conversation a lot of times with my patients. The partner study defined undetectable as less than 200. This is something as a side note that's important to tell people because nowadays our assays for HIV viral loads are so sensitive. A lot of times you get a viral load back that's like 30, 40, 50. These people for the, uh, for the purpose of like whether or not they can transmit it are still undetectable. The other thing I'll say is uh, being on HIV treatment is great. It's important for a lot of reasons. Um, I think that probably makes it less likely through needle sharing. However, I don't really tell my patients that because they should never needle share. And the real reasons why is hep C. When I'm worried about needle sharing, I'm not really worried about HIV so much as I'm worried about hep C. Um, and that is why I would just, if I, I ask about whether or not they're using, like if they have injection practices and I make sure that they have information for the local needle exchange, I teach them how to do like a proper injection about using filters, things like that. That's a lot of safety information that's out there and that you can learn some of it's there too. Um, but I think that's really the key. Um, you know, the other thing though, that I will say is that while well, undetectable, untransmittable, less applicable, is not really applicable to like sharing needles. Uh, what is applicable to injection drug use is that you can prescribe PrEP to people who have injection drug practices as well. Um, the effectiveness rate in studies is a little bit lower for like that. Um, part of that might be because people who are injecting drugs oftentimes have situations where it's like more difficult to take something like PrEP. But again, we know that people participating in chemsex might actually be better at taking PrEP than other people. So I would say that these people should absolutely be on PrEP if they don't have HIV, and that if they are having injection practices, I wouldn't really even to make it frame it around being undetectable or not undetectable. I would frame it about making sure that they have access to those needles. Great, thank you. And one more in the Q&A pod, and then I think we'll move over to the chat because I think there's at least one question in the chat as well. So Zipporah asks, and hey Zipporah, what has been coming up a lot in our practice is people who are ready to cut down or stop using meth and feel if they could be treated for ADHD with prescribed stimulants, it would be helpful. However, providers do not want to prescribe stimulants due to the risk of using prescribed stimulants on top of meth. How do you approach this? Yeah, so I do a lot of prescribing. Uh, there's, there's a couple of different things you can do. So evidence-based treatments that I give a lot of my patients uh, with a methamphetamine use disorder specifically, mirtazapine at night to help reestablish that sleep-wake cycle. It also reduces anxiety, and it also can be used for people who are still using to treat methamphetamine withdrawals. Very safe medicine, and there's two randomized controlled studies that support that. Bupropion is a wonderful option. There was a study out of Yale showing that the combination of bupropion and naltrexone um, helps people control their use. Bupropion is chemically similar to amphetamines. It's a stimulant. It's also off-label treatment for ADHD, and I often use it at the highest dose, 450 milligrams at the beginning of the day along with the naltrexone. This reduces cravings. It gives them uh, back some of that wakefulness that they're missing once they don't have meth. And what's actually really important in terms of prescribing practices is avoiding SSRIs with these people. SSRIs, as I use as the acronym, make people fat and flat. They are not indicated for people with chemsex use disorders because it, uh, they need to reestablish a sexual life without substances. The other nice thing about a bupropion is it actually stimulates libido. And so it's helping treat that as well. So that combination of bupropion, naltrexone, and mirtazapine is really helpful and supported by evidence. And it will also do that. Now, I will also say there actually was a street study out of San Francisco showing that high dose Vyvanse for people with injection methamphetamine use disorders was helpful for these people. What I tell people is that when we're thinking about a substance use disorder, because they also treat a lot of opioid use disorder, think about the real world alternative. The real world alternative to not giving these people a prescribed stimulant, especially a long acting one, is that they're going to continue injecting meth or they're going to continue doing whatever it is they're doing. What you're prescribing them is never going to be worse than what they already have. And especially if they have some ADD symptoms, I think it's a great idea. And specifically, I would recommend using a long acting stimulant like Adderall XR, specifically Vyvanse would be the best one. Why? You cannot inject Vyvanse. It doesn't work because it's already metabolized uh, like uh, the, way it's, uh, the way the molecule is and you cannot snort at uh, Vyvanse. So for those people at your practice, what I would recommend is that you should consider it uh, and that Vyvanse would be the drug of choice because it's long acting, you can't get high from it. And it's always going to be safer than what they're doing. Honestly, even if they were just popping tons of Adam, uh, like Adderall short release, at least it's a safer supply now that there's actually fentanyl in the, um, in the drug supply. 
The other thing that actually that's bringing up in my mind is that the other thing I like about doing the bupropion naltrexone is that more and more we are seeing opioids and supplies of stimulants. It's important to tell people if you're giving them bupropion naltrexone that that will block any opioids they're taking, but it also makes me feel safer because even if they're just taking bupropion naltrexone to reduce their use or help control it, it will prevent them from getting any effects if their drug supply happens to be mixed with opioids. I hope that answered your question. And I'm happy to talk more about that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. We are close to the top of the hour, but we have a couple more questions here in the pod um, and one, I believe, in the chat. So we invite folks to stay on if you're able. Um, and Amy, this this one should be simple. Um, she just wanted to repeat your, uh, you know, your alternative phrase for harm reduction, which, of course, safety optimization. Um, so I'll, <laughs> I took that one for you if it's, it's OK. Um, and uh, we have Jessica here asking, do you ever use Vivitrol injection instead of naltrexone? So in this case, it's really not relevant. Uh, I don't do that. And the reason why is that the reason why people don't like the naltrexone oral is that if you're using it for a treatment for opioid use disorder, if people just decide not to take it one day, then like they don't have that same protection. Um, naltrexone is indicated, uh, like it works in the craving center in the brain for a lot of things. It's actually even in weight loss drugs now. And I find that people who are using meth or whatever, they don't have a problem taking the oral naltrexone because uh, it doesn't affect them if they decide to use. If they decide to use meth again, or they decide to use, or if they're still using G on top of it, like I prescribe it to a lot of people, again, who just want to use less. It's whatever the goal of the patient is. I do a lot of work on optimizing safety where a lot of people's goals are not no use. It's just more control on the use, keeping it on the weekends or something like that. And naltrexone is safe to take orally all through that. You could theoretically, if someone really just didn't want to take a pill, do an injectable naltrexone, but there's really not any benefit to doing that way. And I haven't really found it necessary for patients. Great, great. And I think this might be the last one. Um, John is asking, um, you, you mentioned some evidence-based interventions about meth. Could you please share those? About meth? Yes. Yes, so some of what I've just been talking about is that. So again, mirtazapine is supported by clinical trials, uh, by two, it's the highest amount of evidence for two randomized clinical trials for methamphetamine use disorder. Um, the bupropion naltrexone is supported by a study as well. Um, Topamax or topiramate is also has some research behind it for use in methamphetamine use disorder. Anecdotally and in clinical practice, I use that for people with euphoric recall. If that's shooting over your head, send me a re, uh, an email. Um, I use that one a little bit less often because it has some kidney side effects you have to monitor closely. And so I use it more for people that are really were like free or former slammers, have euphoric recall, and our, their goal is total abstinence. But the nice thing about that bupropion naltrexone and uh, mirtazapine is those are very safe medicines that people can continue to use even while if they like use on top of it. And I want to think about that because often at times people will still use intermittently. And that's fine because what a substance use disorder is, again, is that disordered behavior. Um, but yeah, happy more to talk about those. And I believe the follow-up lecture, uh, I, I, uh, I think they will be talking a little bit more about the research behind that. And I do give other talks about that, but today I focused on the theory. Well, this has just been so fantastic, Yona. Thank you so much. And to everybody who stayed on with us even a little bit past the top of the hour here, um, lots of really great engagement. And of course, Yona has their email up and their LinkedIn up. So feel free to reach out. Um, and as Yona did mention, we have a follow-up session, well, not follow-up, but another um, chemsex focused session coming up in June. Um, so it is when you can't stop the party, the, the syndemic of HIV and chemsex that is available. Um, Registration is open on the Nahud website. We have another session in May. Of course, these are first Friday um, webinar sessions. So primary care considerations for patients using methamphetamines will be on Friday. May 6th. So please go to our website, check those out. Um, slides from today and the recording will be up on our website as well. Um, again, reminder to please complete your evaluation, um, regardless of, you know, whether you're looking for credits or um, certificates or anything, we just would really appreciate your feedback, of course. And just thank you all so very much. Happy Friday. And we hope to see you in May, May 6th for the next one. Thanks so much.